This is Business Analytics Using Forecasting, and I'm Galit Shmueli. In this video, we'll continue talking about binary forecasts and specifically about evaluating performance. In the previous video, we talked about the first half of the forecasting process. We talked about defining the goal, about the types of data that we have. We saw how we have to visualize binary series in a different way. And we talked about data partitioning and benchmarks. We're now going to talk about evaluating performance so that we can compare models and see how well they'll work in the future. Let us return to the Melbourne rainfall example that we introduced earlier. Suppose again that our goal is to create next day forecasts of the binary outcome, rain or no rain. Our original data include the actual amount of daily rainfall, and we've created a new derived binary variable that takes on the value one if it rained on that day and zero if not. In numerical forecasting, we used metrics such as MAPE, MAD, and MSC. Can we use these same metrics to summarize binary forecast errors? To answer this, let's consider what the forecast errors look like in binary forecasting. Here's an example of output from some binary forecasting method. We see a column called predicted class, which is our binary forecast. This binary forecast is typically the result of comparing the forecasted probability with a cutoff value selected by the user. For example, here the first observation has a forecasted probability of 0.45 that it will rain. Comparing 0.45 to the cutoff of 0.5, the binary forecast is set to zero. A forecast error based on the binary forecasts can therefore take only one of three different values. It could be zero, it could be one, or it could be minus one. Combining these numbers into metrics such as MAPE, MSC, or MAD is therefore less useful. A simpler and clearer way to summarize the performance of a model for binary forecasts is using a classification matrix. This is simply a two by two table that shows the counts of correctly classified zeros, correctly classified ones, misclassified zeros, and misclassified ones. In the rows, we have the actual value, and in the columns, we have the forecasted value. In this example, we see that the model correctly forecasted 492 rainy days and 1,980 non-rainy days. It was incorrect for the other days. 806 days were incorrectly forecasted as non-rain, but actually it did rain on those days. And 375 days were incorrectly forecasted as rainy, but it did not rain on those days. Various performance metrics can be computed from these four numbers in the classification matrix. For example, here are the error rates for rainy and non-rainy days. This model is wrong on 62% of rainy days. It's wrong only on 16% of non-rainy days. As we did in the case of numerical forecasts, here too we can compute performance separately for the training period and the validation period. The validation period performance tells us how well this model will work in the future. Comparing the training to the validation performance can help us identify cases of overfitting. Here are two more popular predictive performance measures that are based on the four numbers from the classification matrix. The sensitivity of a model is its ability to forecast ones correctly. In our example, it's the ability of the model to detect rainy days. The specificity of a model is its ability to rule out the zeros. In our example, it's the ability of the model to rule out non-rain days. Sensitivity and specificity are always reported together as a pair. They are useful when one outcome or one class is more important than the other. If rainy days are more important to us than non-rain days, then we would compute sensitivity and specificity with respect to rain. Rain would be our one, and no rain would be our zero. But we could equally be interested more in accurately forecasting non-rain days, for example, maybe we're a tour company and we want to know when to schedule our walking tours outdoors when there's no rain. In that case, 
I want to compute my sensitivity and specificity metrics with respect to no rain. And no rain will be the one or the class that's more interesting. We can also compute other things besides sensitivity and specificity. If we have costs of forecasting things incorrectly, then we can include those costs and compute what is going to be the cost of deploying our forecasting model in a real life scenario. So to summarize, binary forecasts arise in many different scenarios. Three typical scenarios are trying to forecast the direction of a numerical variable so that we have numerical series, but we're trying to generate binary forecasts. The second scenario that we talked about is we have events over time, or binary data, and we're trying to forecast whether the event will happen or not in the future. And the third scenario is when we again have numerical series, but we care about a binary outcome where this numerical series crosses a threshold of interest. In all these cases, we're talking about binary forecasts. In these two videos, we discussed what do we do differently in binary forecasting compared to numerical forecasting. We saw that the data might be different. We saw that the goals might be different. And we also saw that even visualization is different. Specifically, we look at more aggregated data rather than looking at binary series. We talked about benchmarks, and specifically, we talked about another type of an IE forecast. We talked about predicting either a probability of an event or generating an actual binary forecast, a zero or one. We also discussed some new types of predictive metrics, and specifically, we talked about the classification matrix and different metrics that can be based on this matrix. What we're going to be talking about next is specialized forecasting methods that can deal with binary forecasts. <laughs>